I've had opportunity to travel a little in the world, to the Orient, I've been to Africa, I've been all through the Americas, North and South, Europe, spent time in Greece and Rome, Istanbul, and other places. I even tried one summer to spend the summer laying on the beach in Hawaii, and I miserably failed. If there was one place I would like to return to, and I had my choice, it would be to Jerusalem and to Israel. Because it's there that you see history and prophecy combined. And you get a flavor of all walk the streets where Jesus walked. <coughs> and as you see things in the light <coughs> of not only the past, but the prophetic vision. And it began years ago. As though he was there personally, opened the vision so that I could almost see what he was saying. Love for him. Love for the Lord. And it's in that sense then that tonight, I found in some notes that my wife had written, Helen May. A choice little statement that I'd like to read to you. It's the digest, digest of her thinking. I in happened to Lehi's family. He saw the gathering of Israel. He saw wars and rumors of wars. He saw the work would commence in preparing the way. He saw the final scenes. Which messages would be of the greatest impact that would go to Joseph's descendants. Now, my brothers and sisters, the Book of Mormon is a tailor-made book. It's drawn from a teaching. It's not just where Camorra was and where Bountiful was and all of that and where the narrow neck of land was, which, by the way, wasn't the Isthmus of Panama. It's not a book to do. It's a book to testify to the eternal God and to testify that God has not his covenants to ancient Israel, and that he will bring to pass those covenants, and that Isaiah, of all time, who loved Zion so much, pled with the Lord to know the whole time in concentration to where the Lord finally opened the vision, and he wrote away. And that's what I'd like to talk about. And in that, that vision of Zion has been given to the righteous of all ages of time. It was given to ancient Israel. It was given to the Nephites, our tribes, come to us with the special benefits of inspired commentary, who knew and had seen it as God sees it, not as we see it. And believe me, the Lord sees it differently than we see it members of the church happy with many members of the church noonday and he sees us entirely different. the book of mormon has a key and needs of the saviors these inspired commentaries to help idle work give a this challenging study of isaiah so that unfolds vision and some to fulfill our responsibility in the great vision that he had Okay, now point number one. Isaiah spoke to all Israel in all generations of time. Now that means that the Jews could read Isaiah, and he wrote in such an ingenious way that the Jews could say he's talking. The Nephites could read Isaiah, and he wrote in such an ingenious way that the Nephites could say us. And he did that for all 12 tribes of Israel, for all generations of time. In that sense, then, he writes by revelation, not just to one person, to one group, but he's writing to the whole. For example, here in 1 Nephi 19, Nephi's commentary on the subject as he, he says, I did read many things... 
which were written in the book of Moses, but that I might more fully persuade them to believe in the Lord their Redeemer, I did read unto them the prophet Isaiah. And I all scripture unto us. Now what's he doing? He's reading Isaiah and saying, Isaiah is writing to us. He's applying scripture, all of it, to himself. And he goes on unto them, saying, Hear ye the words of ye who are a remnant of the house of Israel, a branch who have been broken off. Hear ye the words of the prophet which are written unto all them unto yourself, to Isaiah. When people read Isaiah, a lot of times they want to go back six, seven hundred years B.C. and find out what Isaiah said to that generation. And that's all right. That's the subject. And then you through and of, uh, all the languages that relate to the world of that time. And when you study Isaiah, you just study him in relation to 700 B.C. and you say that's what that is not what Isaiah is all about. It is true that he wrote to his day and to his age and was a prophet to his generation, but his heart was so filled with the desire to see Zion and understand it that the Lord finally opened that vision to him, and that vision was way down in the last days, down in our day and the time that's yet future. And he saw it. And then he wrote in a revelatory way in such a way that that grind, which is the challenge of all nations, that great challenge then was made applicable to Israel of the whole twelve tribes and to each generation of Israel from his day on down. But there was a focus, that final focus then, while he wrote to all generations and to all Israel, that final focus. Is, for example, turn to Third Nephi chapter 20 where the Savior now is speaking and giving us an in, And he says this, verse uh, 11 through 13. Ye remember that I spake unto you and said that when the words of Isaiah should be fulfilled, written, ye have them before you, therefore search them. I say unto you that when they shall be fulfilled, the filling of the covenant people, O house of Israel, See, now that says something. And then shall the remnants which gathered in from the east and from the west and from the south to the knowledge of the Lord their God who hath redeemed concerns primarily what generation of time. He's been the ones, and they can apply that which he wrote. True Israel is Zion. And he wrote to them and the challenge then to hope for it. And to but Isaiah knew that that great hope would only come to consummation in the last days. And so when the B.C. so much, that's by the morning newspaper. Now that's key number one. All nations with the focus on the last sign of which he speaks would be fulfilled. Or the other one is this. Closely read that there are more fulfilled in more. For example, let me turn to inspired vision in the Pearl of Grace. Now, Matthew has gave it to additional insights of the disciples. It indicates they want what is being, and, or the destruction of the wicked. Before that, now, thou hast So while Matthew 24, the land of Jerusalem, and the scattering of the Jews throughout the world, now that part of the Jesus himself now to those Jewish people and their polity, their government, their program. And as he does that, he tells them something about the difficulties to be associated with it. And he says, many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity of many shall wax cold. But he that remaineth overcome, the same shall be saved. Well, he says this, and here's the point I want to come to. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet concerning the destruction of Jerusalem, 
Then shall he stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Now Daniel the prophet gives us a prophecy concerning what he calls the abomination of desolation, as it applies to Jerusalem. When Jesus is about the destruction of their own country, which was fulfilled uh, in 68 to 70 A.D., when the Roman general Titus brought a Roman army in, surrounded Jerusalem, and set up the siege that finally overthrew that city. That were massacred. Women became so hungry they ate their own children. And it was literally a bloody orgy. Josephus, contemporary with the period of time, tells us quite a bit about it. Now, the Savior says, when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, then stand in holy place. Then he warned his disciples, in Judea flee into the mountain, and let him who is on the housetop flee, and not return, neither take anything out of the house, neither let him who is in the field return back, or take any of his clothes. You just get out of the country. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. Therefore pray. Ye the Lord, that your flight be not in the winter, which would make it difficult, neither on the Sabbath, because you can only take so many steps on the Sabbath. And you're running along, and there's a Roman soldier after you, and you're counting them off, one, three, four, five, six, seven, and you come to the end of how many you can take, and he's still on your heels. So pray then that it doesn't take place in the winter or on the Sabbath. See? Now those Jewish people who heard that, uh, and Jesus gave them a sign. He says, when you shall see Jerusalem encompassed by the armies, then know that the desolation there was nigh. So you, and so the Jewish Christians, when they saw the Roman armies under Titus come, remembered Christ's prophecy and remembered the sign he had given to them. And they got out of the country, and they didn't get killed. But the Jewish people then who were there remained set up a defense, Roman armies besieged the city, and a devastating massacre took place. Now shortly after that, the great massacre at Masada took place, and that's a, another marvelous, interesting thing, to climb Masada and uh, see the massacre that took place there and the whole community committing suicide rather than surrendering to the uh, Roman armies who finally built the ramp up by Jewish slaves taken from Jerusalem and finally battered down the door of the, that city on the hilltop called Masada. It's an interesting place and a, uh, really a dramatic story that's there. The point I want to make, though, is that Daniel talked about this. Now when Jesus shifts gears and he talks about the last days, he talks about conditions that will take place in the last days. And he says this, and again, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Then, uh, one aspect of his prophecy is going to take place again. And again, the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come, or the destruction of the wicked. And note this now, and again shall the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet be fulfilled. There will come a time then when the armies of all nations, particularly those of Babylon and of uh, the Assyrian, the latter-day Assyrian, or Gog and Magog from the north, the uh, forces then that come from the north that Ezekiel describes in Ezekiel 38 and 9, and they'll set up a siege against the city of Jerusalem. And again the city will be sieged, and again the city will capitulate. The only difference is this time, when the city capitulates, Christ will then stand on the Mount of Olives. And that will change the ball game. That will change it, see. But there's two fulfillments of the abomination of desolation. Daniel makes one prophecy, it's fulfilled twice. Now what I'm saying here in relation to Isaiah is that Isaiah does the same thing. Isaiah then writes in such a way that there is a multiple fulfillment of what he says, particularly for his day and for ours, that in particular.
Now, for example, note, as you read through the Book of Mormon, and here's reason again to study every word. Get key passages. Don't just get your eyeballs over them and pass over them lightly. Some of them you need to read them frontwards and backwards and upside down and over and under, and then study them. Now here is one of them. This is 3 Nephi chapter 23. And the Savior here is speaking now of Isaiah. And it says this beginning with verse 1, Now behold, I say unto you that ye ought to search these things. Yea, a commandment I give unto you that you search these things diligently, for great are the words of Isaiah. Now, if the Savior would say that to the Nephite saints, what do you think he would say to us? Where the prophecy of Isaiah have their focus in our day. What would he say to us? Now note what he goes on and says, For surely he spake as touching all things concerning my people. He wrote, as I've said, to all generations, to all Israel in all generations. He spake as touching all things concerning my people, which are of the house of Israel. Therefore, it must needs be that he uh, must speak unto also to the Gentiles. Now the key verse is verse 3. He says, And all things that he spake have been and shall be. Now do you see the multiple picture there? All things that he spake have been and shall be, even according to the words which he spake. In other words, some things had been fulfilled and they're due to be fulfilled again. And so those things that he wrote then have been fulfilled and they shall be fulfilled. And so you read Isaiah then understanding this. Now here in 2 Nephi chapter 6, you have uh, uh, Jacob, this great prophet, uh, who in my opinion is one of the great prophets in the Nephite culture, man who got through and got the blessings of the second comforter and saw the Lord and saw the visions of heaven open and the visions of the future open, and who stood as a stalwart next then to Nephi and whose prophecies with those of Nephi set the mold of Nephite culture from there a day on down through, see. Now he, in chapter 6, comes to uh, the issue of Isaiah. Nephi apparently hadn't done everything that he wanted to do to get in this record what ought to be got in this record concerning Isaiah. And so he asked Jacob, now will you take up the labor and put a little in? Now in verse 4 then, he begins, he says, Now behold, I would speak unto you concerning things which are and things which are to come. Wherefore, I will read you the words of Isaiah. Now do you pick up the key there? Isaiah then wrote what? Things which are, he wrote them for his day, and they all to apply to the future. Uh, and so Jacob, knowing that, see, understanding that, and now going to comment, comment on some uh, Isaiah passages from chapter 49 of Isaiah, he says, Now behold, I would speak to you concerning these things which are, that's the present, and which are to come, that same thing applies to the future, wherefore I will read you the words of Isaiah. And they are the words which my brother, Nephi this, have desired that I should speak unto you, and I speak unto you for your sakes that ye may learn and glorify the name of God. Now the words which I shall read are they which Isaiah said concerning all the house of Israel. Wherefore, they may be likened unto you. Note the application. Each, each segment is likened unto you, likened unto you, for ye are of the house of Israel. And there are many things which have been spoken by Isaiah which may be likened unto you because ye are of the house of Israel. All right, now, in that sense, we read Isaiah and we read him as it pertains to us. That's another important key. Now, a third important key deals with the idea of symbols. Here you are, Isaiah, 700 and some odd years B.C., and you have an assignment to write by revelation to all Israel in all generations of time with a focus on things that are going to take place 25, 6, 700 years later. 
And how are you going to communicate your ideas? You don't know their language. You uh, are going to write to all Israel. And so, typical of the Hebraic way of communications, you write with symbols. Symbols become highly important, and symbols are, are highly important to the understanding of scriptural passages. For example, let me turn to the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 11, and just read you something as an illustration of what I mean. Now, in Revelation 11, this chapter deals with the two prophets who are going to be raised up in Jerusalem at the time of this abomination of desolation when it takes place, and who will have power like Enoch of old and like Elijah through the power of the holy priesthood, and who through that power will hold in abeyance for a time the Gentile and heathen hordes that come against Jerusalem. Now, these two prophets, though, as the city is overrun, will eventually be killed, and their bodies will lay in the streets, and the Gentiles and heathens will send letters of accommodation and gladness and joy about them back and forth and say, let's have a celebration, then let's go in and mop the rest of those guys up. And while they're in that planning stage of festivities, then the trumpet sounds, the resurrection of the righteous takes place, just as Christ stands upon the mount. And uh, since these two prophets are righteous, they're going to be resurrected. And so they get right up there off the street to the astonishment of many. And their resurrection takes place. They ascend then. Christ stands upon the Mount of Olives. Uh, devastation, cataclysm happens. The Mount of Olives is cleaves asunder, part of it moving to the north and part to the south. Huge valley is created into which the Jews then flee. And in the sacred recesses of that valley, then Christ makes his appearance to them, discloses himself as Jesus of Nazareth, whom their fathers had crucified. All right, now uh, note what John the Revelator says about that. In verse 8 of chapter 11, speaking now of these two prophets, he says, Their dead bodies shall be in the streets of the great city which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, where was Christ crucified? Jerusalem. And what does the Lord use as a symbol to designate that city? We call it the holy city. There's nothing holy about it. It's holy because Christ was there. But he got crucified. It's holy then because other prophets were there, and they were stoned and martyred. And it's holy because it's the center of prophetic history and prophetic vision. But so far as the inhabitants are concerned, the Lord who sees things uh, a little more accurately calls them Sodom. And what does that mean? And he calls them Egypt. And what does that mean? The flesh pots. And so he calls Jerusalem, not the holy city, he calls Jerusalem, Sodom, and Egypt. Now he uses a couple of names then that uh, apply, and uh, they're symbols. They're symbols, see. Uh, Egypt is symbol, symbol of the flesh pots. Sodom is symbol. And we've got Sodom in America. America is Sodom. And it's that kind of thing, see, that he uses to designate. And he speaks through and by symbols. And you see the symbol and then you associate. Now, for example, in ancient days, the Lord's work centered in Jerusalem. And so Jerusalem becomes a symbol. In ancient days, there was a little kingdom made up of the Edomites. And they were a worldly kingdom. And from the kingdom of Edom, we get the word Idumia, which means the world. And the Lord uses that term in the scriptures, right? 
All right, now he uses, let me give you an illustration of, of the Jerusalem thing. This is, uh, this is Isaiah chapter 3, but it's found now in uh, uh, the Book of Mormon in 2 Nephi chapter 13. And he says now, behold the uh, For behold the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole staff of bread and the whole stay of water. Now that passage pertains to our day, not just related to our day. He is speaking of our day. That is our day. But he's using the symbol, Jerusalem. Now the symbol Jerusalem in our day means what? Where's the center of the Lord's work? What city is it? You just use the initials SLC and you got it. You see that? That's the center of the Lord's work. And then the land associated with Jerusalem was the land of Judah. Now the land associated with, with the modern Jerusalem, i.e. SLC, is what land? It's the land of America. And so Isaiah 3 is talking about using symbols Judah and Jerusalem, i.e. Salt Lake City and the land associated with that center of the Lord's Word. Okay? Now, can you see that? Now, we'll come back to that in a little bit. All right, now, another key to the understanding of uh, uh, Isaiah is found in 2 Nephi chapter 25. And here in verse 4, Nephi commenting on the subject makes this statement. Wherefore hearken, O my people, which are of the house of Israel, and give ear unto my words. For because the words of Isaiah are not plain unto you, nevertheless they are plain unto all those who are filled with the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy includes an understanding of what has been revealed. One must understand Nephi's vision, for example, in order to understand Isaiah. You've got to catch Nephi's vision of the last days. We talked about that last night. And that becomes a key of insight, and it helps you to get the spirit of prophecy and to understand what Isaiah is talking about. I had a Book of Mormon teacher years ago. He was a real Book of Mormon scholar. He had translated the Book of Mormon into the tongue and language. He had been through it and he loved it. He just, he just exuded the love for that book, and, and I grew to love him dearly as a result. He made a statement that I have always cherished, and that is, the Book of Mormon evidences its divine origin because it's a key to the knowledge of the Bible. You can't understand the Bible without understanding the Book of Mormon. You can't understand the gathering of Israel as foretold by Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah and others unless you get to the Book of Mormon and it becomes the key of revelation and knowledge, see? Now, similarly, then, Isaiah can only be understood by understanding Nephi. And Nephi's great prophecy, as we said last time, last night, and it's the main prophetic theme of the Book of Mormon concerning the last days. In fact, it's almost the only prophetic theme uh, in the Book of Mormon about the last days. And this is about an era of warfare against Zion, and that's us if we're Zion. And we need to be aware of it. Most of us are asleep at the switch. That there's going to be a great era of warfare against Zion. Nephi sees that in 1 Nephi 14. He comments extensively on it in 1 Nephi 22. Jacob picks up the theme in 2 Nephi 6. Jesus picks it up in 3 Nephi 16 and 3 Nephi 20 and 21, 22. And then you have Mormon come around and summarizing the thing again, see. It's the great prophetic theme of the last days. And by and large, the Latter-day Saints are essentially asleep at the switch. They don't know what the Book of Mormon says about them in the last days. Little wonder we have to have a prophet aged though he be. Just literally 
with all the energy of his soul, says, Hey, get to that book. Flood the church and the world with the Book of Mormon. It's the keystone to our religion. You can get closer to God than to knowing what God is doing in our day by reading that book than any other book. It's the greatest miracle of modern times. How a person like Joseph Smith, who couldn't dictate a coherent letter, according to Emma, and who couldn't spell the word February without using the Ermine Thummim, could produce that book in less than 75 working days, I don't know. I've written a few books in my time. My book, God, Man in the Universe, I wrote 12 times with a ballpoint pen and typed it before I finally abandoned it to the publishers. And since it's been published and I've learned a lot more, I'm going to add a lot more to it, I've gone back and rewritten the manuscript again, and it's sitting in manuscript form in my study. And that's taken a period of extensive years after years, and for a young, edu uneducated kid, spindle-legged kid, if I can call him that, and I love Joseph. I love him. I've concentrated my life's teachings and my life's effort on that man. And uh, my foreordained mission, I suspect, in some measure, is to help people to understand him. And that was true in pre-earth life as well as here. And with that, then, I, I think I understand the person and how he could produce that book and do it in a working period of 35 days. That's greater thing that you can contemplate. It's, it's a greater miracle than crossing the Red Sea. I mean, that was trivial in comparison with the translation of the Book of Mormon. See? All right, uh, in that sense, then, you've got to have the spirit of prophecy. So to summarize it to the present, Number one, he spoke to all generations, to all Israel and all generations. Number two, the last days, when Isaiah really comes out and is really fully in our day and our time. And number three, then, there are multiple fulfillments. His words are fulfilled more than once. He could say something about Judah and Jerusalem that apply to his day. But since it applies to our day in the sense of focus, then Nephi puts it in there with a very clear statement that those chapters in the Book of Mormon weren't included as a history lesson. Read them, read them for our day, see. And then uh, he writes in symbols, and finally then you have to have the spirit of prophecy, which indicates that you need also to understand the prophetic vision of men like Nephi and others. And then Isaiah begins to be understandable, literally. It begins to be understandable. You can read it and say, hey, that stuff makes sense. And it not only makes sense, believe me, it's got some of the most sacred and significant disclosures in it of any book in the Book of Mormon. It really has, and it's covered up until you get into it and see it. Well, now with that, let's take Nephi's works and begin to go through. The first uh, chapters, and keep in mind now, in the Book of Mormon, there are nine the book of Isaiah, quoted verbatim. Now, they're not quoted so verbatim that they follow all the heirs of the King James translation. Joseph was working from an independent record, and he was working as a seer in his translative processes. And while he includes those 19 chapters, he doesn't go to the King James Version and just put them in. He doesn't do that. There are too many slight differences of wording and inclusions within those 19 chapters, a full thing, giving to us an entirely different rendition of Isaiah on key points and key issues, which are highly showing that he wasn't just copying from the King James Version. He was rather instead getting his work from the plates of Nephi, and in that sense, then, that's our origin. But of these 19 chapters now, the first two that are put together, and in 1 Nephi 21. Now let's go back, though, in our reading, and let's read Nephi's introduction to them. Let's begin, for example, in the introduction with uh, uh, Nephi 19. He says, Nevertheless, when that, that the uh, say, 
therefore turn aside their hearts against the Holy One of Israel. And he's talking about the Jewish people here uh, and Israel in general. He says, uh, uh, Then will he remember the covenants which he made to their fathers. Yea, and then will he remember the isles of the sea. Yea, and all the people who are of the house of Israel will I gather in, saith the Lord, according to the words of the prophet Zenos, from the four quarters of the earth. Yea, and all the earth shall see the salvation of the Lord, saith the prophet. Every nation, kindred, tongue, and people shall be blessed. And we can bear his arm in the eyes of all nations. And uh, that simply ancient Egypt delivered Israel out of ancient Egypt. He made bare his arm before that nation with great power and with plagues and with judgments. And then as Israel left Egypt, the cloud and smoke by day and the pillar of fire by night from the Egyptian army. And it was a display of divine power that finally consummated in the dividing of the Red Sea and the marching of the Israelites through and Pharaoh sending his horsemen and his chariots and soldiers through to get into the middle and have the walls cave in on them. Now that was, that was uh, making bare his arm in the eyes of that nation. And in the latter day, there is a day of power. As David puts it, in the day of thy power shall thy people be willing. Let me give you the equivalent to that now in section 90 of the Doctrine and Covenants, beginning here with verse 9, where he's talking about the gospel program in our dispensation and our day. And speaking now to the First Presidency, he says that through your administration, they, that is the church, may receive the word, and through their administration first, and then behold and lo, this will turn unto the Jews. And then cometh the day when the arm of the Lord shall be revealed in power unto the convincing of the nations, the heathen nations, these are the non-Judea Christians, and the house of Joseph, these are the great Indian nations of Central and South America, and some here in North America, convincing them of the gospel of their salvation. For it should come to pass in that day, now that's not quite yet, but we're getting in there, when it comes to pass in that day that every man shall hear the fullness of the gospel in his own tongue and his own language through those who are ordained unto this power by the administration of the Comforter shed forth for the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's going to come a day when the most popular topic discussed on this earth is Mormonism. There's going to come a day when that topic is so pertinent and so vital to people that they will either divide one side or the other. And there's going to come a day when there will be a great division of all people on this earth over the issue of the restored gospel and the Zion program which is being built. Nephi sees that. Nephi talks about that. And this now is the day when Isaiah's prophecy will be fulfilled. See. Now, he goes on here in his introduction, and let's move then from verses 15 uh, through 17 to verse 22 now through 24. In verse 22 he says, Now it came to pass that I, Nephi, did teach my brethren these things, and it came to pass that I did read many things to them which were engraven upon the plates of brass that they might know concerning the doings of the Lord in other lands among people of old. And I did read many things unto them, and I quoted this one a minute ago here from the book of Moses, but that I might more fully persuade them to believe in the Lord their Redeemer. I did read unto them that which was written by the prophet Isaiah, for it did liken all Scripture unto us, that it might be for our profit and learning. Wherefore I spake unto them, saying, Hear the words of the prophet, of the house of Israel, a branch who have been broken off, hear ye the words of the prophet which are written unto all the house of Israel, and liken them unto yourselves, that ye may have, have hope as well as your brethren from whom ye have been broken off, for after this manner has the prophet written. And then he includes Isaiah 48 and 49. Now Nephi saw our day, and he wants to get the message of the Lord over to our day and to his people, particularly in our day. 
And he writes himself. And then to get corroborating testimony, he puts two chapters of Isaiah in there. And he later puts a lot more in there, see, and says, now look, this stuff relates to you people, and it's going to be fulfilled in the last days. Now read it. So with that, then, let's read a little from Isaiah 48, which, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, it's Isaiah 48, First Nephi chapter 20. Now, it's the commentary. Well, before we do that, let's, let's, let's pick up the commentary, because I want you to get both ends. We've given the introduction, and then let's talk here a little bit about the commentary, and then we'll come back to, to Isaiah 48. Now, having, having uh, included Isaiah 48 and 49, then 1 Nephi 22 is a commentary. It's Nephi's inspired revelatory commentary on these two chapters. And so if you want to know what these two chapters are about, and you want to make it easy on yourself, then go read the commentary, see. Go read what Nephi says. And uh, in the commentary now, he speaks then of uh, Israel. He speaks, for example, of uh, the Lord raising up a great Gentile nation. And then in verse 6 he says, Nevertheless, after they shall be nursed by the Gentiles, and the Lord will lift up his hand upon the Gentiles and set them up for a standard. Now, what's a standard? Well, the standard is something by which you measure something, is it not? If you got the New Standard Dictionary, that's, uh, that's the latest uh, in definition of words. Now, uh, Zion is to be an enzyme. That's something that you stick up so that people can see. In ancient times when they had military campaigns, they had an enzyme. And you converged on and made the attack according to the position of the enzyme. It's something to which you gathered. A standard is something by which you measure things. I have here the standard works of the church. We don't worry about personal opinion. If you have some differences of understanding and doctrine, and you, you get the ruler. Now, the ruler is a standard. If you've got a argument on how long it is from over here to over there, you get yourself a yardstick and you measure it, and then that, that's the end of argument. Now, if you want to do the same in regard to doctrine and truth, then you take this ruler, this thing we call the standard works. And if the standard works teaches it, that's the end of basic doctrine, is it not? That's the end of it. And you don't say, well, I got my opinion, you got your opinion. You say, to the law and the testimony, just like Isaiah would say. To the law and the testimony. What do the scriptures say? To what do they bear witness? All right, now, Zion is going to be a standard. But a standard, in that sense, uh, needs to be understood. We talk, for example, about Mount Zion. And uh, we had a question that came up this afternoon that I didn't pick up until after it was over with. So I want to ask about Mount Zion. Well, the word mount, what does the word mount mean? It means a couple of things. It's symbolic of, this, of a mountain, which is strength and power, symbolic of that. But uh, there's another view of it that's important. If you get upon your mount and ride, what are you doing? Well, you got a horse, and you mount the horse, right? You ride it. Your mount is that which, on which you sit. Your mount is that which is your foundation, right? All right, now Mount Zion. Is Zion established upon her mount? And what is the mount of Zion? What is that on which Zion rests? And the answer is the house of the Lord, the sacred covenants relating to the holy order of God, the sacred covenant of obedience to God, of sacrifice, the sacred covenant of the gospel, of virtue and holiness, the sacred covenant of consecration, committing your life, that sacred order that pertains to the order of kings and priests, and those sacred powers that deal with the sealing powers of the holy priesthood. Now, that, those are the mount. That's on the thing on which Zion is established. Zion has an economic order. It's called the law of consecration and stewardship. It has its basis in the house of the Lord. 
Zion has a political system, a political order of kings like King Benjamin and Mosiah, uh, righteous kings who had their rule of authority from the temple, not merely a secular potentate, but their rule of authority was centered in the covenants of the temple. Now when Zion is built upon her mount and fully established with the sealing powers and the endowment of glory that comes from yielding obedience and establishing those sacred ordinances in our lives and building up that order so that there is a cloud and smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night over every dwelling place, then Zion becomes Mount Zion. Now we've got uh, some interesting uses of Zion all over the western states. Zion this and Zion that, and there's no more Zion than a Gentile institution. They're not established with glory and power. They've taken the name with probably good intent, but they're not Zion in the things on which they're built. Hopefully they'll do a better job, more honest and more efficient in righteousness than others. But if you're going to have Zion, you first of all got to have a temple for the foundation. It's got to be based in the house of the Lord, see. And then when it's based in the house of the Lord and the society outside the temple conforms totally and completely in the temple so that the society is an extension of those sacred covenants and so there are sanctified people who have entered the house of the Lord and received sacred ordinances and who have received the blessings of the holy priest in the fullness and in sealing power and the blessings of the Spirit then are poured out like a cloud and smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night, then you have Mount Zion, and then you have a standard. And not until then do you have a standard. And the Lord says he is going to set he lift up his hand upon the Gentiles, and in this sense he's talking about those of the Gentiles who embrace the gospel, and set them up for a standard. Now, Nephi tells us how that standard is going to be established. We read that last night as we got into 1 Nephi 14. We found there that there's two churches, and there's the church of the uh, abominable church of the earth, and there's the church of the Lamb. And the church of the Lamb, more specifically defined, consists of the righteous Latter-day Saints, those then who have applied the gospel so much so that they've got the gifts and the revelations and the spiritual endowments of the Spirit with them. And as this time of opposition comes against them, then Nephi says, I beheld that the saints of the Lamb of God were endowed with the power, the Spirit and power of God in great glory. Now that's building the standard. This standard of which Isaiah speaks and which uh, Nephi comments about here is raised in adversity. Isaiah chapter 1 says, Zion shall be redeemed with judgment and her converts with righteousness. And he's going to restore things as they were in ancient times, see. All right, now, in this time when we begin to do this, then Zion becomes a standard out of adversity. And while you may be sitting in the dust, and there will be those who will be driven and smitten whole communities of Latter-day Saints in the warfare against Zion. Nevertheless, those who are faithful and those who are righteous, though they may sit in the dust, will enjoy Pentecost, and they'll have the gifts of the Spirit, and they'll have the revelations of the Spirit, and they'll have the power of God in great glory begin to descend upon them. And they'll get over the complacency that we see too often manifest among our people today. And those then who really commit themselves to the Lord and purify their hearts and learn what home teaching is all about and what service in the church is all about and do it with a love out of the abundance of their hearts with the Spirit of the Lord as the basis of their lives and begin to be sanctified, they'll begin to get the endowment of glory. And when they do that, Zion will be raised as an ensign and a standard, which we do not yet have. Okay? So he tells them they're going to raise up this standard. And then he explains to them 
uh, concerning making bare his arm in the eyes of all nations. And we talked about that last night. Verse Nephi uh, 22, chapter 10 and 11, I would, my brethren, you should know that all the kindreds of the earth cannot be blessed. I remember reading that years ago and registering for the property the first time. I said, hey, you know, that's an, that's an interesting situation. Uh, you're going to beat the tar out of someone so they can get blessed. <laughs> I mean, you're going to really stomp someone with the objective in mind of, of blessing the guy. Now, the Lord can, can do marvelous things. And as I said earlier today, Mormonism reconciles the irreconcilable. And uh, the Lord works that way. Sometimes when he works with the greatest adversity among people, it's designed to give them the greatest blessings. And sometimes when those then who suffer the greatest adversity and all the rest of us kind of look down our noses at them, that's the very time when the Lord is operating in their lives with the refiner's fire. And the greatest difficulty, the far the greatest difficulty to meet, the far the greatest challenge to meet is the challenge of contradiction. It's the challenge of contradiction. And uh, a lot of times when the Lord really wants to work on your soul, he'll work through the challenge of contradiction. But he will make bare his arm in the eyes of all nations for what purpose? That all kindreds of the earth might be blessed all kindreds of the earth. Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence something like this. He says it's the disposition of people to suffer as long as suffering is endurable rather than change the forms of society to which they are accustomed. And sometimes you have to break that mold. And the end result then is to bless the people. And the Lord, through the judgments that comes, allows those molds to be broken allows that to happen with the end objective of blessing the people. Now let's hurry on. Isaiah 48 then, uh, we've seen it in light of Nephi's introduction, Nephi's uh, uh, commentary. Now Isaiah 48 then deals with Latter-day Israel and her redemption. Let me just uh, read an excerpt or two out of it. This now is chapter uh, uh, 20 of First Nephi. And let's just pick up an excerpt or two to catch the idea. Verse 1, Hearken and hear this, O house of Israel, who are called by the name of Israel, and who are come forth out of the waters of Judah or out of the waters of baptism. Now, that's not in the King James Version. Who swear by the name of the Lord and make mention of the God of Israel, yet they swear not in truth nor in righteousness. Nevertheless, they call themselves the holy city, but they do not stay themselves upon the God of Israel, who is the Lord of hosts. Yea, the Lord of hosts is his name. Now, applied to us, what does that say? What does that say to the Latter-day Saints? Let's read it and apply it to us. What does it say? What do we do? We swear by the name of the Lord and make mention of the God of Israel, yet they swear not in truth nor in righteousness. Nevertheless, they call themselves the holy city. And you might, uh, and I don't want to say it, but you draw your conclusions what city that is. But they do not stay themselves upon the God of Israel. We begin to be the slime capital and the sleaze capital of the nation. And we do not stay ourselves on the God of Israel, and yet we're all righteousness in external things. And there's a lot of good Mormons who are shopping on Sunday and who are doing a lot of things. We've got a, we've got a video shop there in the little town of, of uh, Alpine. It's about, about like this town here. There's, there's eight wards there and one stake. And... Uh, I happen to be on the high council in, with the assignment to one of the wards, the second ward. This is the ward where the, all the big and lovely homes are built. But our bishop was talking to this video shop owner, and he says, you'd just be surprised how many videos are checked out of here who are R and X rated. 
and yet we've probably got as high a percentage of activity in the church in the Alpine state as any other state in the church. And uh, all the videos going out, the R and the X rated to our people. See? Now, where are we? See, so he's talking now to all Israel with a focus on our time. Let's turn, for example, to verse 10 and uh, uh, 11. He says, For behold, I have refined thee. Now he's talking about this cleansing that's going to come to Zion. Wherefore I have refined thee, I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. Now he's not talking about all the members of the church. He's talking of those who bring forth Zion. And he has chosen, he's refined them, and he says, I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction for mine own sake. Yea, for mine own sake will I do this, for I will not suffer my name to be polluted, and I will not give my glory to another. See? And so he's going to clean house and refine his people. Now let's turn, for example, to verse 20 and 21. Go ye forth of Babylon. This is talking about the great gathering now when it takes place. Flee from the Chaldeans, with a voice of singing, declare ye, tell ye, uh, tell this, utter to the ends of the earth, say ye, the Lord hath redeemed his servant Jacob, and they thirsted not. He led them through the deserts. He caused the waters to flow out of the rock for them. He clave the rock also, and the waters gushed out. Now, what's that talking about? Well, let me see if I can put it a little more fully in focus. When... Zion has been cleansed and refined on this land, and this will be done through judgment, the warfare against Zion and the coming of the modern Assyrian and all of that kind of thing. And Zion then is raised as an ensign, and the standard is finally raised. And then Nephi, as he sees other churches, he sees the church of the Lamb of God throughout all the world, and he sees the nations of the Gentiles or multitudes from the nations of the Gentiles make war against those people, the saints of God. And then he sees then that these people begin to gather to Zion. That's when the whole of America will be made the Zion of God. And it'll be a marvelous thing. We think we've got a great number when you've got six, eight million people in the church. Well, that's just a good-sized modern city. And, uh, but the time is going to come in the not-too-far-distant future where we're going to make the whole of America the Zion of God. And there is a big bulk of Latter-day Saints right here in this room who will live to see that happen. All right, now when that takes place, and this great gathering of which the Book of Mormon speaks begins and gets underway, when that takes place, these people will wade through much affliction. Some of them will go through deserts. And the Lord will lead them like he led ancient Israel. And as he says, they thirsted not, he led them through the deserts, he caused the waters to flow out of the rock for them, he clave the rock also, and the waters gushed out. And notwithstanding he hath done this, and greater also, there is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. Now those are some of the circumstances in this warfare against Zion and in the gathering of Israel when Isaiah's prophecies are fulfilled. Now in chapter 49, chapter 49, for example, which is 1st Nephi, chapter 21, he's talking of Israel in the latter day. Verse 1, he says, Hearken, O ye house of Israel, all ye that are broken off and that are driven out because of the wickedness of the pastors of my people, yea, all ye that are broken off and that are scattered abroad who are my people, O house of Israel, listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken ye people from afar. The Lord hath called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name, and he hath made my mouth sharp in the shadow of his hand. Now, this first verse, then, is an address to all Israel. Verses 2 to 7 is talking about Christ. It's Isaiah's prophecy about Christ. He hath made my mouth, and this is the Lord himself speaking through made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of his hand hath he hid me and made me a polished shaft in his quiver hath he made me and he said unto me thou art my servant O Israel in whom I will be glorified 
Now, Israel, we understand, applies to a people, but originally and primarily the name of Israel is another name for Christ. It means soldier of God. And who is the real soldier of God? Who is the real soldier? It's Christ, see? And when he speaks here in verse 3 of, O Israel, my servant, in whom I will be glorified, he is talking of Christ. Now, when the Lord changed Jacob's name to Israel, El is, is the Hebrew God, Israel, the, the, the prince of God or the soldier of God. Then the Lord put his name on a body of people, and that name is the name of Israel, the soldier of God, and it's the name primarily of Jesus the Redeemer, the Messiah. And so he's speaking of himself, and he says, Then I said, and this is the Savior's reflection, and maybe uh, challenges for discouragement as he fulfilled his mission as one who uh, was despised of men and whom they didn't recognize and whom they spat upon and finally crucified. He says, And I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Surely my judgment is with the Lord, and I work with my God. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb, that I should be his servant to bring Jacob again to him, speaking now of Christ, though Israel be not gathered, he's talking of Christ now before the fulfillment of this great vision, though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. And he said, it is a little thing. Let me give you a more clear rendition. And he said, it is not enough that thou shouldst be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my servant unto the ends of the earth. Thus saith the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, my Holy One, to him to, to uh, whom man despises, to him whom the nations abhor, to servant of rulers, kings shall see and rise because of the Lord that is faithful. All right, now he's saying, speaking prophetically after talking about Christ, talking of his feelings about this challenge of bringing Israel. And his feelings were he could have some discouragement, see. Having done that, then the Lord addresses all are Israel here in verses 8 to 13. Thus saith the Lord, I in an acceptable time have I heard thee, O isles of the sea, and in the day of salvation have I helped thee. And I will preserve thee, and give thee my servant for a covenant to the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages, that thou mayest say to the prisoners, Go forth, to them that sit in darkness, show yourselves, they shall feed in the ways and their pastures shall be in high places. They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat of the day nor the sun smite them, for he that hath mercy on them shall lead them, even by the springs of water shall he be guided them. And it's again talking of the people coming now to Zion under these adverse circumstances. See, I will make all my mountains away, and my high uh, ways shall I be exalted. And then, when that takes place, then, O house of Israel, Behold, these shall come from far, and lo, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Sinem. All right, now from that point on, he turns his attention to Zion and some very difficult and challenging things. This is one you really want to be awake and alive on. Begins with verse 13, and he says, for example, <coughs> Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, for the feet of those who are in the east shall be established. Now, if you read other passages in Isaiah, he refers to Zion in the last days as those in the east. And so in the midst of his prophetic picture concerning the gathering of Israel, then he says, Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, for the feet of those who are in the east shall be established. In other words, we'll, we'll build this, raise this enzyme, this standard, and Zion will be established with strength and with power on her mount, on the, on the house of the Lord, on the covenants, 
and she will be an ensign and a standard to the world. And he goes on and says, And break forth in the singing, O mountains, for they shall be smitten no more. For the Lord hath comforted his people, and will have mercy upon his afflicted. Now that's a glorious thing about Zion. Then he backs up and talks about Zion in this period of adversity, and that's what I say, hold on to your hat, because this one now is a difficult one. Having spoken of her redemption and of Zion's feet being established in righteousness, that he says, but, but, behold, Zion hath said. This is what we will say before that time. Zion hath said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. But the Lord adds, But I will show them that I have not. When the warfare against Zion begins, when there's real-life bullets, and when there's real-life bombardment, and when people sit in the dust in the desert, and when their men fall by the sword, and they're mighty in the war, to use another phrase from Isaiah, Isaiah 4, concerning this time. When that happens, and we've been so conditioned to think about onward and upward, we're building. Look at the missionaries. Look at how many temples we've got. And that's all great. That's all great. And Nephi looks to our time, and President Benson has quoted it, and says, they'll say, all is well in Zion, and Zion prospers, and all is well. And that's our attitude. Now, when that whole thing, ball game changes, and you're sitting in the desert, and you're wondering about your year's supply, and it maybe, isn't it, maybe it isn't even with you, maybe you haven't been able to haul it off with you fast enough, and you're sitting in the desert, and you look at the whole picture and the situation, and you say, hey, I thought we were the true church. I thought this was onward and upward. What are we doing out here? The Lord has forsaken us. He's forgotten us, and he's forsaken us. But he says, but he will show that he hath not. He says, for can a woman forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her, of her womb? Yea, they may forget. Yet will I not forget thee, O house of Israel, Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. And then in the redemption, out of that circumstance, as the redemption takes place, out of those difficult circumstances where we, where we look around and say, Hey, we've been forsaken, and I'm, and I'm out here laying on the bare dock, and it's raining cats and dogs, and I wonder what life is all about and where the... You see... Then, in that time of redemption, he says, Thy children shall make haste against thy destroyers. Now, what does that say? Are there going to be destroyers? There are, and there's going to be a redemption from them. Thy children shall make haste in thy destroyers, and they that made thee waste. Are there going to be those that make Zion waste? You bet. They that made thee waste shall go forth of thee. And then he says, Look at thine eyes around about, and behold, all these gather themselves together, they shall come to thee. Now he's talking about the in, tremendous influx that will then come to Zion. The standard is raised when Zion becomes a sanctified people, when we're established on Mount Zion, or upon her mount, to become the true standard, the true ensign to the nation, the true example of righteous society, the true example of spiritual redemption and of political opportunity, uh, equality, and economic opportunity. When we become that, then there will be a tremendous influx of people and the gathering of people to Zion. And as the Lord says, lift up thy hold, all these gather themselves together. And, and as I live, saith the Lord, thou shalt surely clothe thee with them all and, and bind them on as a bride. For thy waste and the land of thy destruction. Now, there will be waste and desolate places and a land where we then get uh, destroyed in some sense. See, The land then of thy destruction shall even now be too narrow by reason of the inhabitants. That is, there will be so many who will come that there won't be room. And he says, And they that swallowed thee up, 
And there will be those that swallow Zion up. And Zion has got to be delivered from the mighty. And the Lord has covenanted to do that. He says, And they that swallowed thee up shall be far away. And then note what he says, and this is so significant to our generation of Latter-day Saints. The children whom thou shalt have, talking about those that then come in and become children of Zion, the children whom thou shalt have after thou hast lost the first. Now, who's the first? Well, it's that group of Latter-day Saints that get lost from the way, that don't hang on to the Word, who don't know enough about the Gospel and about the prophetic picture. So when they sit there and say, Zion, the Lord has forsaken us, they just simply leave and depart. And there will be multitudes who will leave and forsake the Lord, and forsake his prophets, and forsake his kingdom. The children whom thou shalt receive shalt, shalt have after thou hast lost the first shall again in thine ears say, Now these people who come in after Zion's cleanse and the influx of people that come to her, to her righteous standard, they will then say, The place is too straight for me. Give place to me that I may dwell. Then shalt thou say in thy heart, speaking of Zion as an entity, then shalt thou say in thy heart, who hath begotten me these? All these people coming in, all this great influx of people being converted to the Lord. Who hath begotten me these, seeing I have lost my children, and am desolate, a captive, and removing to and fro? And who hath brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. These, where have they been? And then the Lord answers that, and he says this, Thus saith the Lord, Got my hand to the Gentiles, and set up my standard to the people, and they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders, and kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to the earth of their face towards the earth, and lick up the dust of thy feet. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. For, he explains now, and he quotes now Isaiah here, in fact, this is Isaiah, For shall the prey be taken from the mighty? That's the question. Now, the prey is Zion. As he says, they've been swallowed up. The prey is Zion. And the question is, shall the prey be taken from the mighty, or the lawful captives delivered? That's the question. And the Lord answers, But thus saith the Lord, Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children, and I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh, and they shall be drunken with their own blood, as with sweet wine, and all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior, and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Now, can you catch that picture? Can you see why President Benson says in his first address as our prophet that we will lengthen our stride after we have been cleansed? Right? Remember I read it to you last night? Go check out the issue where it contains his first official address to the saints. And it, it features it right at the top of the page. All right, now what, I, what is Isaiah chapter 48 and 49 about? How significant is it? Again, Nephi saw our day. He looked down through the vista of time and he saw our day. And then he knew that Isaiah spoke of our day. And so in order to get some means of understanding, everyone can't read it very easily. You've got to have keys of insight and you've got to approach the Lord and you've got to have the guidance of his spirit. And so it's just kind of written as a cover-up message. But when you finally see it, and it finally comes out, then what is the message? Our time is gone, and I've got a lot more to say before the break. But I think maybe we better break. We're not we're running out of time on this first lake. I just haven't got time to get over this stuff. Well, I just want to bear you my testimony that the Book of Mormon is written for our day. And it's, it's an ingeniously written document. 
It is an ingeniously written document. It's written by prophets who in vision saw our day and our time, and then put together a compilation not only of their personal writings, but Isaiah who, as I've said, just knocked on the Lord's door day and night, day and night in his life, wanting to really know and understand Zion. Now, he didn't want to know and understand the three years of glory. He didn't want to know and understand that. That's great to know and understand. But he wanted to know and understand Zion. Why? Because he knew that when Zion is established, everything else in relation to the Lord's kingdom is going to be fulfilled. Israel would be gathered. Righteousness would be established. The Lord's law would be set up in the world. And the millennial order would be ushered in. So day and night, pleading with the Lord, I want to know about Zion. And finally, the Lord just opened up to him. Okay, here's this about it. Here's this about it. Now, you write it in such a way that that vision of Zion can appeal to all the house of Israel in all generations of time. So they can have that hope and that ideal of Zion. But you write it in a way so that it's very, very clear that when it is fulfilled, it will apply to the Zion of the last days. And then Nephi makes it very clear that when the time comes that Isaiah is fulfilled, that we'll know that it's being fulfilled. So what I'm talking about here tonight, the day will come in the not far distant future when the disclosures in the Book of Mormon concerning Isaiah will be popularly and generally known and understood. I mean, the Lord blesses to plow into this and get this picture. Study it out. Get on your knees. You can't learn the gospel as well sitting down as you can on your knees. You can get the spirit of revelation. I was back at Syracuse. I told you about it a little the other day. Uh, I got clearance to write this dissertation on Joseph Smith. Here I am sitting as a lone farm boy in an Eastern University. My district president, a great man, I've learned to love that man like a brother. Down one of the spirit like few men I have ever known, sixth grade education, and he massacred the King's English, but power came from that man, tremendous power as he spoke. But he didn't really know much about things, and so I couldn't go to my district president and say, hey, I'm writing about Joseph Smith, and here's this idea of economics and politics and the social order. Uh, tell me, what is the truth on this? This was back in the days before we'd done much of it. And my branch president, he was a great guy too, but uh, he didn't know very much either. And there I was sitting there alone with the challenge of writing a dissertation on the social, economic, and political thought of the prophet Joseph Smith. And there were times, more than one, when I just beat my head against the wall all day long, day after day. And then finally, I just, I, I, I don't, I, I can't see rhyme or reason on this thing. I don't know where I'm going. And finally, I got down on the knees. And I said, Lord, I've got to have revelation. And I don't mean, I don't mean just to thank you, and I don't mean just to pat on the back. I need to know answers, and I've got to have ideas, and I've got to have whole sentences. And I've got to have it. And I wasn't demanding, it was pleading. And then to have the flow of the Spirit in such a degree that I couldn't write fast enough. Just lead sentence, bing, 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 and write it out. And the whole vision of Joseph Smith's Zion and Joseph Smith's kingdom opened. That whole vision. And I would write it down as fast as I could write it. And then I'd spend the next two or three weeks fleshing it out. And I'd go into another problem and do the same thing. And I had a beautiful experience back there. I learned to love the prophet, and I learned to love this great vision of Zion, and I learned to go where I had to go to get answers. I learned that the gospel is true, not just because Joseph Smith is a true prophet, but because a humble father can get and open to view the knowledge of Zion. And it's on that basis that this four-volume work of the prophet Joseph Smith, a lot of it came forth.
came out of those revelations to me as a humble kid seeking desperately under difficult circumstances where you had a faculty that didn't believe in God, the devil, or anything else. Essentially on Joseph. So the vision of the thing to me, I want to bear you my testimony that it's, it's a sacred vision, something that we need to get as the Latter-day Saints. We're all dressed up and know where to go except to get kids in the mission field. When they get back, they don't know where to go from there. Now, we've got a job of building Zion. May the Lord bless us to get to it, I pray. I don't know.